When you own a hotel and you're operating it, you're, it's much more of a business than it is just a simple real estate investment. So it was extremely hands-on. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why? Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Zach Winner. Uh, Zach is a founding partner and CEO of Prosperity CRE, a private equity form, firm specializing in providing passive investment opportunities in multifamily apartment complexes. Um, Zach, there's a whole lot of impressive things here. I'm going to let you tell your story. So let me first just say thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for taking the time out today. I'm, I'm excited to chat. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. I'm, I'm excited to do this as well. Thank you. So Absolutely. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm an attorney by, by training, although I haven't practiced law representing third parties in a number of years. I'm full-time real estate investor. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Prosperity CRE. Um, but I started investing in real estate in the mid 90s. I started out buying single family homes around the country. And then eventually I realized for a variety of reasons, you're better off scaling up into larger apartment complexes and other commercial real estate. And so eventually I transitioned over to, to commercial real estate. And, uh, and then along the way, I started bringing in um, passive investors who wanted to invest alongside me. And initially it's, you know, friends and family, and then it built out from there. So today we're very much focused on providing investment opportunities in large apartment complexes where the rents are below market and where we can come in and do various implement various strategies to increase the net operating income, the cash flow that our investors receive while we hold the property. And then that, of course, significantly increases the overall value of the property so that when we ultimately sell the property, our investors are receiving a very nice profit on sale as well. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you started in the 90s investing in real estate. When did you yeah. kind of move towards uh, multifamily? Um, so I moved towards larger multifamily about uh, eight years ago. So about, let's say about 17 years ago, I bought my first commercial property and that was at a hotel in Austin, Texas, a 72 room uh, hotel that, that was an airport hotel. So we had a couple of shuttles running to and from the airport. And, and that was my first foray outside of just buying single family homes and renting them out into something much larger. And, um, and, and we did quite well with that. We sold it about seven years ago. Um, we've, we own a couple of industrial flex office parks in St. Louis. These are multi-tenanted um, industrial flex office parks where the front is office, office or showroom and then the back is warehousing. Um, mm -hmm. And those are all triple net lease tenants. Um, both of our um, parks are 100% occupied. They're doing very well, but we're really focused at this point on on larger apartment complexes. And so we acquired our first one. Um, we acquired an 80 unit um, about five years ago, and uh, and then we sold it about a year and a half ago and 1031 exchanged into a 180 unit apartment complex. That's fantastic. You, you, so, I mean, you've kind of run the gamut in terms of different asset types, which is pretty cool yeah. to have that. And also, I mean, if you started in the 90s, you've been through some uh, market <laughs> ups and downs for sure. Yes. So you, you're, you, you bought a hotel as your first commercial property. How, how does yeah. that come up? I mean, that's like a, I'm sure a lot of people listening are like, that's a huge step from owning from some single family residential things, which in a way it is, but uh, I'm sure, you know, you could, maybe you can even go into kind of how, how you came across that and, and made that, you know, leap and then like maybe why it was an okay leap to take. Yeah, so um, we looked at a bunch of different property types 
what we liked about the hotel was the, re the, the returns were better than other, um, other property types. But the flip side of that is when you own a hotel and you're operating it, you're, it's much more of a business than it is just a simple real estate investment. So it was extremely hands-on. We, we had third-party hotel management, but it, at our level, which is called the mid-level hotel, it's comp, our, we had a Wyndham flagged hotel with franchisees under the Wyndham brand. And that level is very similar to like a Holiday Inn Express or a La Quinto or a Hampton Inn. And at that level, the, the hotel management companies are not great. And so, during the period in which we owned it, we cycled through three different property management companies. So, and we were very, very hands-on, and we had to be to make sure that um, that uh, it was a profitable venture. But because of our experience with that, I I would not buy another hotel. It's just, it's kind of like owning an apartment building, but you have to replace the tenants in every every apartment every day, right? You've got new tenants coming in every day. <laughs> Right. So, right. So, so it's very hands on. We did very well with it. But um, but, you know, as you mentioned, I've owned a number of different types of properties. And um, and and uh, my feeling is is for a variety of reasons, multifamily is a very strong property type to invest in. Yeah, for sure. Well, why don't you touch on that kind of talk about why you think uh, you know, multifamily is your asset class of choice, given your experience yeah. and, you know, sort of what what draws you. I mean, I, I have my ideas of why I like multifamily yeah. as well, but uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. So happy to. So we're not doing ground up where we're value add, right? So we're buying existing properties mm -hmm. where the rents are below market and then we're coming in and upgrading the units, upgrading the common areas, et cetera, increasing the rents. There may be some additional streams of revenue that we can add. There may be some expenses that we can cut. But essentially, that that's the play. And so if that's the play and we're upgrading all of the units, it typically takes us about two years to upgrade all the units, right? These are units where the leases are typically one-year leases. When the leases come up for renewal, renewal will determine which ones we want to renew and which ones we want the tenants to vacate so that we can upgrade them and then release them at a higher rate. So in my view, one of the great benefits of this strategy as opposed to something else like a hotel or like our industrial flex office parks is um, the velocity at which you can come in and, and build that equity through increasing the NOI. You can do it much faster in multifamily because the leases are only a year lease and with us, we're not we're not vacating the whole building, so it takes us a couple of years to to cycle through the leases, but that's fine. Right. So after you know two or three years of holding the property, you've increased the equity a tremendous amount, and then you can, you know, 1031 exchange harvest that equity, 1031 exchange into a larger property and repeat the cycle all over again. So it's a much a much higher velocity than other other types of properties where you have long-term leases and you know so maybe like in retail or industrial or office these are longer term leases maybe they're annual rent bumps but they're relatively small rent bumps right like two three percent yep and 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 you've got to wait for that lease to expire to then really significantly increase the rents so so the velocity at which you can increase the rents increase the noi and then go and harvest that equity you know, through a sale or even through a cash out refi, if that's your strategy, it's just a, just a lot quicker. So that's one of the main reasons I like, you know, multifamily as opposed to office or retail or industrial. Yeah, yeah and it, 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 some great points. And I think it really just comes down to what is whatever your investment strategy is, because you know, some people love industrial because it's long term leases and it's kind yeah. of like a maybe a more um, stable a little less hands-on but yeah you're not going to get you're not going to be able to maybe as quickly um harvest or t take advantage of of a hot market right if if you know right. we a couple of years ago we were in a really hot market for rents in multifamily that was you know that made a lot of people a lot of money if you were yeah. an industrial with a 10-year lease 
you you can't really do a whole lot to just increase those lease rates uh right you know kind of at on the fly so it's it's just different you know different strategies there you know i've heard people argue that self storage is good because you can change the lease any time you change it every month if you want to you know that you sort of right. based on occupancy and stuff but again it's it's all just what, what's your strategy what you're comfortable with what um yeah. what is your you know sort of risk level or uh comfort with risk all of that so i, I think multifamily is to me probably the best balance of all the things um mm -hmm. in terms of you know sort of risk and, and ability like you said to uh on a relatively short time frame increase those rents you know versus some of the other asset classes but uh, you know it's, it's just again whatever is uh, individual to you you yeah. uh well, we're both here in Southern California, but um, it sounds like maybe you don't invest here, um, and, no. and thus far neither do I. Uh, are you mo mainly focused on Texas? I know you mentioned um, Austin and San Antonio, or what, what markets do you like? Um, so right now we we don't have any product in in Texas. Um, we are looking in in Dallas Fort Worth. We like that market. Um, I think Austin is, is just blown out. It's just gotten too expensive. We're not seeing any product there. San Antonio, yeah. they've got a little distress, kind of similar to Phoenix. So we're a little bit cautious about San Antonio. We won't go into Houston because of climate change issues and insurance issues. So in Texas, we're, we're kind of isolated into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But we like um, a few markets in the Midwest and the Southeast that are our target markets. You know, we. We have like 20 different metrics that we look at to determine what we feel are the strongest markets for multifamily. And there, I'm sure they're ones that you're familiar with, you know, no rent control, landlord friendly, job growth, business growth, population growth, net migration in. We like diverse economies with mm -hmm. at least some component that's STEM related. So, uh, so we like Kansas City very much, um, Columbus, Indianapolis, um, uh, Des Moines. Uh, Omaha. Um, our latest acquisition is in Greensboro, North Carolina. We very much like the Piedmont Triad and, and the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill Research Triangle. Yeah, yeah. Those. Um, that that's a. I don't. I don't really invest in the the Midwest. I know a lot of people love those markets. I, I just don't have familiarity with them. But the the Southeast is uh, certain parts like you hear about maybe Atlanta and Charlotte, but um, yeah. I mean, Greenville is, is like, has been growing. My wife's from Charlotte. I mean, that Greenville's grown mm. a ton in the last nice. uh, 10 years and continues to grow. So it's, it's, um, that's a, that's a really nice market to be in. Yeah. yeah what do you, a lot of phenomenal I mean, growth over there. Yeah. As a, as an attorney by trade, what, what do you, what do you like to do? You know, what's, what's your seat at the syndication table? What, what parts of the deal do you like to be involved in? Um, mm -hmm. or maybe, maybe it's all of them, but what, what do you like to do? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's actually a very good combination with, with my car partner, the co-founder of Prosperity CRE. He has a, uh, commercial lending background. So he's, he's very good on the debt side and on underwriting the deals. And then with my legal background, you know, I, I, I'm good interfacing with respect to, you know, doing the LOIs and then interfacing with the um, transactional attorney on, on the purchase and sale agreement, interfacing with our SEC attorney on the offering memorandums, things of that nature. And then I have a communications background as well, a corporate communications background. So I'm typically, you know, the main point of contact for, um, for our investor relations. Um, and um, we we very strongly believe in in open and frequent communication. So we do monthly updates on all of our all of our um, offerings. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, especially now, uh, I think you know investor relations is you know one of the most important components of this. When when people some people are a little bit leery of what the market's done they, they need to understand right. you know kind of what's going on good and bad and and be um you know almost over communicated with it just so that yeah. they know uh where things stand so um that's very good so what do you uh i guess what do, what do you see coming we have been 
in a challenging market cycle, I know you don't have a crystal ball. What do you think yeah. uh, about this next, whether it's six, 12, 18 months? What, what are you thinking um, we're gonna see on the horizon? It is, it is a crystal ball, um, but I, with respect to interest rates, I think, you know, from what I've seen, chances are more likely than not that the Fed stopped raising rates and we're in a pausing period. And, um, and assuming inflation doesn't spike really high, I think we'll stay in a pause until sometime in maybe May or June and, and the Fed you know, will start lowering. And so maybe we'll see a total of like 1% reduction um, mm -hmm. this year in the Fed funds borrowing rate. So I think I think that's all great for you know real estate investing. I, my point of view has been even through last year is if interest rates accelerated at a higher pace than you know essentially ever, right? And so if if my feeling has been if you could get a deal that pencils out and meets your investor return metrics based off of whatever interest rate you are locking in at, you're positioning yourself very well for a nice exit three, five, seven years down the road, because in all likelihood, interest rates are going to be lower when you exit than, right. than the interest rate yep. you got when you got in. So everything else being equal, the property is going to be worth more money. So, yeah. and that continues no, to be my, my belief. I think like in, in a few years, interest rates are going to be lower than they are today. So, you know, as long as you're successful in implementing your strategy to increase your NOI, that's just going to be additional tailwind to help you with with a nice profitable exit. Right, right, and it, it, the uh, you know the cap rates tend to fluctuate. Maybe not you know point for point with interest rates, right. but they're certainly going to be impacted by them. And so when we saw we had such a hot market, cap rates were really compressed. Well, then as you said, the interest rates shot up higher and faster than you know, than they ever have before. So right. your cap rates go up, jump up, and it, it, it's been a really um, quite a bit of an up and down roller coaster. But but at the end of the day, yeah, we, n who no nobody can really predict the future, but nobody really expects right. that the rates are just going to like keep going up from here. We, we've had um, you know we, we whether it pauses for a while, comes down, whatever. But but yeah, if you're, I think the trouble that has arisen for some is is based on like oh we thought the interest rates were going to stay at two and a half and you know here they didn't and so um that's <laughs> that's just one of those things that i mean i remember a couple years back uh being at some of the large real estate conferences and and people on stage saying oh we, we expect uh, the federal funds rate to go negative and and like yeah. it really was you know people thought that was going to happen I'm not an economist. I didn't. I didn't claim to have. I'm like that'll be great, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> didn't claim to have any sort of true knowledge as to what was going to happen there. But I think. But I think counting on that and and uh, underwriting to that is is what what got some people in trouble um, here. But you know, it's it's been. Yeah. It's been challenging, but you're right. Right. The, the interest rate is only. I've always kind of thought this way. Like the interest rate is one box on your underwriting. Yeah. Uh, in your yeah. underwriting model, and so, if all else works, it doesn't matter if that interest rate is high. You know, just like you said, if you're still getting to the returns you want at that interest rate, great. And if you're, and then if you're able to refinance at some point, or as you say, exit when the rates come down, it's gonna it's gonna actually be even better. So, um, yeah, it's a it's very important point I think for people to understand when when, when you know sort of putting not putting too much stock into what the actual rate is. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. <clears throat> Although this this last cycle, I think where people got in trouble, and I didn't see this as much as I thought I would, but people who, uh, investors who purchased using either bridge debt or adjustable rate debt, those are the ones mm -hmm. that I think got in trouble. One of the kind of the black swan events from uh, that resulted from the Fed raising interest rates faster than they've ever done before is um, these uh, investors who had an adjustable rate loan that had to buy a rate lock. And those rate locks renewed annually, 
when the interest rates spiked, they were looking at like, you know, 400% increases in the cost of that rate lock. And yeah. it really, yeah. uh, I think it really hit some investors who, who unfortunately went into an adjustable rate loan with a rate cap. Yeah. So. And I, I, some, I mean, not to get too deep in the weeds on <laughs> lending and things like that, but it, it really is a huge component of, uh, real estate in general, but especially commercial large scale real estate, because you're talking about, you know, huge swings in actual dollars because the, the, you know, the transaction amounts are so big. So you change that rate a little bit. It makes a big difference. But yeah. the, um, the interesting thing, you know, kind of just to, to piggyback on what you're talking about is we, we had a couple of things happen, like those rate as the, the, loans, a lot of them, I think I've heard maybe 80% of the loans that originated during, you know, whatever it was, 2021, uh, was, were, were bridge debt. So maybe floating rate, maybe not floating rate, but still those bridge debt lenders, they aren't as, I guess, stable, if you will, the, the lenders themselves are not as stable as when you're, you're, uh, have agency debt like Fannie Freddie. So mm -hmm. you, I think, things we, you know, we've had the lenders kind of changing the rules midstream and people saying, you know, they, because of, you mentioned the rate caps, oh, well now you have to reserve for this rate cap that we expect that's going to be, you know, right. instead of $30,000, it's going to be $300,000. Like, and so things that uh, people weren't prepared for because it would have been pretty hard to prepare for that, I guess, in, yeah. in, in uh, now I think having gone through this people are going to understand in the future like we could be a little bit more leery about bridge debt or really understand right what you're getting into so it's all you can you can use it all i think as as learning lessons absolutely yeah yeah I th that's why i think it really was kind of a black swan event that nobody really had you know the foresight to envision well what if rates go up from you know zero to six percent what does that do to the rate cap right yeah i yeah. mean so yeah so I, we had <laughs> we really had kind of three black swan events in the span of you know three years really like it was we have covid then we have uh, yeah. all the the money getting printed and then we have all the interest standard. rates go up you know so yeah. fast and it, it just the the it, and it was all it's all reactionary it's it, i don't know it's just yeah. kind of funny to see it's like maybe just don't Maybe just don't react so much when something like right. that happens, and it won't be it won't be such a strong response. But yeah, yeah. Um, and it, it, interesting to see. You know, hopefully we don't run into this combination of events again. Yeah. Um, well, let me uh, let me switch gears, Zach. I want to um, get to ask you the questions I ask every guest. Um, sure. With first being based on the name of the show is know your why. So so what is your why? What what drives you? You've been been doing real estate for a while. I've had a lot of success. What kind of keeps you going? Um, you know, towards bigger and bigger goals. Yeah. Well, so I'll, I'll tell you, um, my first job when I was a teenager was um, I got a job as a lifeguard, and um, which I loved it. And um, one of the highlights was getting my paycheck and going to the bank and uh, opening a bank, a savings account. And back then you would get a book and they would write in the amount of your deposit and they'd stamp it, right? And so I love taking my check and my book and, and seeing how much I was building up and accruing in that account, right? And it just was a real sense of accomplishment. Yeah. And so I think similarly, I, I've always loved that idea at, at, and the gratification of 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 whether it's a job or you know even more so with a with some real estate or an investment where you're increasing the value where you're getting cash flow so that's really what i enjoy doing is i'm kind of you know in that sense a deal junkie where i love you know identifying a way to create value in an in for example an apartment complex and then successfully implementing on these various strategies to increase the cash flow and the value and then ultimately when we sell it, you know, have a huge, huge uh, profit on sale and being able to deliver that to our investors is, is very rewarding. So. Yeah, I, I agree. I, it's funny how, um, I don't know that I, 
necess- I knew that I knew like I cared about you know good returns for investors and stuff, but I didn't yeah. necessarily recognize how satisfying it would be like when you're sending out distributions when you're like yeah b- because the alternative is not it's not at all satisfying it's very when you have to right. pause distributions when you have challenges yeah. like that feels very bad but it's yeah. just even even before like we hit this these market changes and everybody was distributed i was like i didn't i don't know that i recognized just how kind of fulfilling that would be to be like look at this we're you know here are these people that trusted us and we're repaying that kind yeah. of thing so i do think it's a um it's I mean, really one of my favorite parts of the whole process is is just getting right. to that point where you're, you're 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 doing what you said you were going to do right it's just that that's that's kind of the the uh yeah the goal and, and if you're able to exceed what you projected right well we yeah. projected you know say for example eight percent cash on cash and we're delivering 10 or you know, or whatever it is, I think, you know, it's just, it's, it's very gratifying to be able to, right. to meet or exceed what you'd projected. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the second question for you, tell, tell us something about yourself mm-hmm. that uh, isn't common knowledge, special skill, a hobby, anything to let listeners know you better. Uh, well, every year I try to read at least a dozen books, so a book a month. And so I was able to do it the last two years, and so and so now I'm, I've set out my my list of books for for 2024 and working through them. But uh, yeah, but I I enjoy trying to read, you know, a little bit each day, and uh, yeah, healthy mind, so, healthy uh, body. Yeah, exactly. You you sort of um, maybe alluded to this, but I was going to ask you: do you do you pick the books? You know, kind of okay. This is my year in advance list or do you uh you kind of pick on the fly i i have a running list so on 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 amazon prime right so you can create a a a list of whatever products i have a reading list so i just every time i hear about an interesting book i just add it to the list and then i always kind of oh i want to read this one first no no i want to read this one second and so yeah so i have a big long list and then for 2024 i made it i made a sub list of Here's what I want to read for 2024. Yeah. Nice. So, do you are they are they all um, like real estate related, or or this is just kind of like I just, just like a book, some something uh, uh, you know involving other interests or you know fiction, whatever. So, um, or is it kind of? They're not necessarily business related books. I've read you know a lot of business related books, but and they're not real estate. So. The book I'm reading right now is The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. So nothing to do with real estate, right? But it's nonfiction. Mm-hmm. It's a fascinating book. The next book I have on my list is, is a book called Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides Trap by Graham Allison. Um, so again, it's nonfiction, nothing to do with real estate. Uh, and then I have a book on artificial intelligence. Uh, I've got a few biographies. I'm really into Walter Isaacson. I've read, he's a biographer. He wrote the most recently the book on Elon Musk and he wrote the Steve Jobs book, did a biography on Ben Franklin. That's wonderful. Um, he did one on Leonardo da Vinci. That's on my list for this year. Um, he did one on Einstein. That's on my list for this year. So I usually will have at least a few biographies on the list and, and then i have i put some fiction in there as well very cool very cool yeah good yeah. to have to, right, maybe for i went through a phase where i was reading just like every real estate book that i could get my hands on and then you yeah. know, start like a lot of the stuff's the same right it's like your syndication yeah. is there's only so many books there's only so many ways to spin it but um yeah. yeah then starting to throw in other you know other types of nonfiction and fiction it just it just makes it keeps reading interesting, so I, I love that. Yeah. Um, w- when people hear this and they want to reach out to you, what's the best way? Uh, so I'm on I'm on LinkedIn, um, Zach Winner on LinkedIn. Um, they're welcome to go to our company's website, which is prosperitycre.com, and um, and then they can reach out to me directly from there as well. Um, so those are probably the two easiest ways. Okay. Yeah, and, and we'll put we'll put those links in the show notes so people can find you as well. 
Um, cool. My final question for you, what, what piece of advice would you give to someone who um, wants to get started in real estate? They hear this, this they're uh, you know inspired yeah. by your so story, sounds interesting. What, what uh -huh. would you tell them uh, to have the, get them in the right direction? I, you know, I think initially, like I started out buying single family homes because that's what I was comfortable doing. And I think a lot of people start out that way. You know, it's just where, where their mindset is, what they're comfortable doing. And so you can either try and do it all yourself and, and, and buy a small property and rent it out like a home, single family home somewhere and rent it out. But um, or or you can invest passively um, like my investors. They're all investing passively with me, but they're able to invest alongside me. We handle everything and they're investing in you know, much larger uh, properties when they in invest with a group like ours. But I'd say, you know, there, um, you can do very well with real estate, but I don't think it's necessarily a, a get rich quick venture. It's a get, you can get rich, but it's not necessarily get rich quick. So I think um, what I would say is take your time, do your due diligence, you know, chat with people, um, about the perspective investment, really feel comfortable with it before you start throwing money into it. If you're looking at investing with, you know, anybody like like me or another another group, I think you shouldn't be blinded by by like what they say the returns are going to be and not look at anything else. You need to take a close look at what the track record has been. And, and have a real comfort level with the general partner, the person that's going to be essentially running the show. I think that's more important than the, you know, what they're projecting the profits are going to be. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think, you, you know, the projections are, they tend to be in the same ballpark, uh, you know, sort of across the, the multifamily offerings that you're gonna see. and. Yeah. It, so, but it really just comes down to you know, do you, do you trust that operator to to actually achieve those projections that they have there, and, yep. and that might be based on track record, might be based on just the fact that you know them well. I mean, what, whatever metrics you want to use, but yeah, you, you're you're really investing in the team as much as you are, you know, kind of just those numbers. So, uh, I love what you said there about you know, kind of understanding that. Um, well. This was great, Zach. Thank you for for taking the time out today. Thank you for coming on and, and sharing your story. And, and like I said, we'll get um, we'll get all of your links in the show notes for when people listen. They can reach out to you. But but thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jason. It was a pleasure. Enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, if folks listening, um, I know you're going to get a lot of value from this episode. Please like, rate, and review the show so we can get more great guests like Zach. And thank you all for listening. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why? Why?